Tonight joining us is a gentleman that I first met in democratic politics about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, he has a litany of offenses in, in democratic politics from the Kennedy campaign in 1980 um, on through the Mondale Ferraro campaign in 84. Um, we worked together in 1988 on the Gephardt campaign. Uh, Joe's a guy who has really been driven more more by issues and passion for issues than probably any other guy out there. Um, I heard him describe himself tonight in dinner as a hack. A lot of people would think that uh, a pejorative description, but for a lot of people who do politics, you know, we don't we don't think of that as a pejorative. Because if, if you do have a passion for it, if you do have a desire to attempt to affect change, then what you end up doing is spending a good part of your life going from campaign to campaign, from issue to issue, and trying to do precisely that. Um, Joe's a guy who has done precisely that. So if you would, please give a big welcome to the former director of the Dean Campaign, Joe Trippi. Thank you. Thanks, Trippi. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. As mentioned, the Dean Campaign. That one. Yeah, you might remember that. Um, and we shook things up a little bit. A little bit. Joe um, has a book out called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And I wanted to know if he had credited Gil Scott Heron with the title of that book. Of course. Cleverly concealed in my back. I do have a couple of questions, though. <laughs> um, yes, we did. I, I, I did credit him. Good. <laughs> One of the things that we've talked about is, um, through the study group today and over dinner tonight, um, is obviously the impact of the internet and technology, mm -hmm. how it's going to affect campaigns, how it will affect campaigns in the future. Also, um, talked a little bit about the fact that you do claim hack status, and I don't <laughs> say that as a pejorative. But for people who make a living in politics, people who are part of the consultant class, who do bill through traditional media as a rule, how do you see the internet changing that sort of business model, and does it change the type of people who are going to be attracted to oh. professional politics? Yeah, I mean it changes everything. I mean the the, the internet and um, the way we communicate is is going to disrupt everything, in my view, from politics, government, corporations, uh, journalism, and you're seeing that. But it's um, we're not witnessing just a shift in power in, in uh, communications. This isn't a shift from radio to, to television that happened in the 50s, uh, where you know it's basically the advertisers just changed what medium they were advertising in, and uh, you know we we had. That's not Joe. Not Could you please shut that off? It's not me. I turned mine off. Mine's off. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, let me let me go through through this. What's happening is, if information's power, and they're telling us we live in the information age, then, and it's because the reason they're calling it the information age is because the internet's moving all this information around all of us. Anybody who has access to it has access. I have access to the same information you do. Well, if information's power, then it's not just distributing information anymore. It's distributing power, and that's what the net's doing. It's redistributing power to the bottom. Um, and taking it away from the advertisers, the politicians, the government, um, and putting it in the hands of people again. That's having a huge impact because television changed retail politics. Retail politics used to be knocking on doors, talking to voters. It changed it to calling $5,000 contributors. That's what a re you know, so you could raise a lot of money to talk to all of us on television. So that's. Television took all of us out of the process, unless you had five grand to give to a politician. It took you out of the process. The internet and this sort of grassroots activity is putting people back in, but it's not just putting them in in politics. Napster was the first sign of this. It was a bunch of kids 
deciding that they were going to use the power of connecting over the net to take down a, a recording industry that didn't that wanted to keep selling them an album that sucked when all they wanted to do was buy the one song that was any good. And so all these millions of people used the net and uh, and destroyed the recording industry, at least changed it forever, and the way music's being distributed. The Dean campaign and what you're seeing in politics is we now have the ability to try to wreak havoc on a political system that isn't serving the American people very well. Neither party is. Um, we have the ability to change that, and we have the ability to use the net to connect. That's what the Dean campaign was starting to do. One of the things that clearly people remember most about the Dean campaign, and you know, to a certain extent, Joe Trippi, was the um, the use of the internet, the advent of all this. Was the message of the Dean campaign usurped and overwhelmed by the medium that the message was being forwarded through? And did that did that negatively impact the campaign in the end, do you think? No. I mean, the net, we wouldn't have existed. And we had 432 people. His mom didn't even know he was running until... <laughs> No, I mean, people, it's, it's hard after what we became and we got $59 million and 650,000 people. People forget those days when there were seven of us and we had $98,000 in the bank and, and no one knew his name. I mean, no one. Um, uh, and so, you know, if it wasn't for the Internet and for our ability to connect with each other uh, and with Americans and actually challenge them, challenge each other to, to try to change this you know, change things that we didn't think were going right in this country, the war and, and other things. It, had we not had the Internet, there would have been no way that we would have existed. Um, uh, now... But did that become the story, I guess, rather than the opposition? Oh, it certainly war, became rather. the story, but I think uh, most people, you know, knew what Howard Dean stood for on the war and, and other issues. And I think, look, we didn't get... It wasn't the the... It wasn't the new politics of connecting over the Internet that cost the Dean campaign uh, the election. It was the Dean campaign. I mean, it was it was the old-style politics. It was gas, you know, in a press conference. It was trippy, you know, making a mistake on Crossfire, uh, the CNN show. It was, uh, you know, the old stuff that would have taken down any president. It was negative ads beating living daylights out of us by the Gephardt campaign. Um, but we wouldn't even have been there to get daylights beaten out of us if we hadn't had our, uh, the ability to, uh, uh, the miracle really of 650,000 Americans deciding that they were going to stand together, really outside the structure, official structure of a party. These weren't, none of them were, count, very few of them were county chairs, pre, you know, mm -hmm. within the party structure. These were the vast majority of them Americans that had never been involved in politics before. A lot of them, young people who, uh, I think, the, you know, the lasting impact of the Dean campaign won't be felt for 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, and what I mean by that is, I guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you, that 10 or 15 years from now, there are going to be 30 people, uh, 30, 33 year old types that are going to be elected to Congress over the next 10, 15 years, and the first thing they ever did in their life politically was work for Howard Dean. And worked in that campaign, and I dare say that you know, 40 years from now, there's going to be a, somebody being sworn in as president of the United States, whose first activity, in you know, was to work for Howard Dean. Much like Clinton's first activity was working for George McGovern. Uh, Hillary and Bill both uh, were field organizers for George McGovern in '72. It was that kind of a campaign. That very few campaigns, like the Carter campaign, tended they won. They did their four years in Washington, and the vast majority of people in the Carter effort went home. I mean, you don't, they're not um, in the Clinton administration. I mean, they weren't organizers in the Clinton campaign, uh, you know, or, or any of the other campaigns. The Kennedy campaign in 80 actually gave a lot of fresh blood, as failed as it was, against Carter. There are a lot of people, myself, um, uh, Paul Tully, who uh, uh, passed away in the middle of the Clinton campaign, that stayed active after the Kennedy campaign. I think that's the same thing that's happening with Dean. We, a lot of real fresh, young blood, you know, new 
kids into the system that I don't think would have been there without us. So uh, if that, you know, if that's, you know, that's one thing I'm proud of having something to have, uh, had, you know, come out of that loss. We talked a little bit at dinner about Howard Dean and the and the party and how it's um, his his role as a leader, his role in the leadership and how it is a rather untenable and unleadable group. Um, but yeah, the Democratic Party is impossible to lead when we don't have a president. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it just is. We got you have eight or nine people running for president right now. They'll all be trying to take well, the party in different directions. I think he he may well be, sure. I mean, if we win some Senate and House seats in uh, 2006, he, I think he means it when he says he's not running. I just think, um, let me, look, when you, the, every guy I've ever worked for who ran for President of the United States, I think it was Mo Udall who said that the, the only cure for running for seeking the presidency is embalming fluid once you've decided to run. <laughs> um, once you've decided to run for president, um, whatever that barrier you break through that makes you decide you're going to run, never every four years it's like it's like an addiction. It, it starts you start getting pulled back in. Dick Gephardt, after he loses in 1988, waits 15 years, and the whole 15 years he's plotting, right, for how can he make one more run for the presidency. He makes it in in 2003. So. Uh, uh, you know, Kerry is still out there, mm -hmm. clearly thinks he's going to run. Um, it even works for the people like me who swear that they'll never do it again. I mean, swear like, you know, after the first one. We all know, Johnston, <laughs> you do it and you swear you're not going to ever do it again. It was, you say at the end of a presidential campaign, you say that was the best experience I ever had. And God help me, please don't let me do that ever again. <laughs> and then like four years later, they're like, they're, they're, there's smoking whatever it is around you and the you know and the, no a serious and, no, and, uh, and you know the, you start salivating and you decide you're doing it again and uh, and we don't worry about you if you've done one or two but after you've done two if you do three we know you're crazy and um, Joe used the analogy earlier of a baseball player which was more benign than my analogy of a serial killer so it's just you know no, but it does. You get to the point where uh, uh, you, you know, you, you know, like I've saved a lot of money on psychiatric. Bill. After I did seven presidentials, I can now self-diagnose myself. I don't, you know, I don't need a couch or anything. I'm na I'm nuts. Uh, but uh, I mean, what happens is you you want to do it, um, but at some point it's like it's like a, a, a baseball. A sporting figure is about to retire. Where you, you know, could you go one more inning? Would, could you go? Do you want to play one more season? Of course, you want to play one more season. You love it, but you can't. I mean, you just, you know, I, I, I think I slept two hours a night during the Dean campaign. Probably took ten years off my life, and that was doable when I was 24 in the Kennedy campaign. It, it was, you know, I actually thought I was going to die. <laughs> in the Dean campaign, so I don't see, I mean, at some point you just can't, it, it, the, it, it's tough to do. And the pressure, the one thing that's really amazing to me is, you know, the, the pressure in a presidential is like, um, you start off with 432 people and no one knows your guy's name and you go to work every day and you kind of just go to work and go, like, God, I really hope I don't screw up and blow this because if I do, Howard's going to have to find a job. You know, that's like, that's how it is in the early days. And then, and then like one day you wake up and you have 650,000 people out there busting their ears and they've contributed $59 million and they're working their hearts out. And you wake up and you say, oh man, please, please don't let me do anything to screw this up today. Who cares about Howard having to look for his job? I can't. I just don't want to have anything to do with breaking the hearts of 650,000 Americans that are out there trying to make this country a better place and, 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 and trying to change things. And then, you know, I've also been there with Fritz Mondale when we won the nomination. And then you're sitting there saying, oh, my God, please don't let me blow anything today because if I do, him find a job, the easy part. Breaking the 650,000 volunteers' hearts, I can live with that. 50 million, the whole party, potentially the history of the United States. 
I mean, <laughs> no, seriously, it starts. It really starts. That's why the Kerry campaign got so got so careful. I mean, got care, more careful all the way down because towards the end, you are carrying this unbelievable like weight on your of this thing, and you just don't please God. Don't let me say something. To, Washington Post, the New York Times today, that blows this thing. And election day finally comes. And when it does, that thing goes sliding off, win or lose. And that's when you say, that was the greatest thing I've ever been involved in. And please don't ever, ever let me put that on my shoulders again. And every four years, there's wackos like me who come out and do it the seventh, eighth, ninth. Actually, I've got to be... One of the I don't think there's a whole lot of seven timers out there. Um, there's a couple. But I mean I mean it's it's, yeah. it's a dwindling yeah, population. It's, it's, an, a, it's a very non elite club <laughs> of crazy people. People aren't fighting to get in. Yeah, exactly. In reference to those those mistakes, those points where you know that some type of dynamic has changed, um, we talked about election night in Iowa a little bit and how that was just the final nail in an already right. shut coffin. At, at what point did you begin to see the, the coffin looming, shall we say? And what, what really brought that about? And just sort of share a little bit. Having come from you know, that summer of 2003, that fall of 2003, and to have that turn like that, to because that was a fairly precipitous fall, I guess. Well, I mean, I mean, I got the way that campaign happened. You know, there were things that happened in the very, very early days of the Dean campaign that you know where you knew um, there were going to be big, big, big problems later on. Um, um, and, you know, he, on occasion, Howard, early on, when we were cute and cuddly and no one uh, was paying much attention to us and the, couldn't get our name in the paper if we tried, uh, he would, one of his favorite lines was to say that, you know, if Bill Clinton can become America's first black president, I want to become America's first gay president. Um, he meant that having signed the civil unions law and, and, and uh, giving equal rights uh, for everybody. Uh, it, you kind of like as a professional who has done this for a long time, um, it, it kind of like you drug him into the back room and said, please don't ever say that again. Um, and he would get it immediately and go, yeah, you're right, I shouldn't say that. And then and he'd be good and about three weeks later he'd say it again. And and I'm talking, this is real early. I mean, this is like when we're 432 people. Well, you know, he said it when ABC, C-SPAN, CNN, the New York Times, the LA Times were in the room. They just weren't going to write. I mean, the LA, New York Times is not going to put a headline, Dean says he wants to be America's first gay president. It's not going to be, I mean, no one in America would know who they were talking about. This is like, you know, so the reporters didn't write it. And, but you knew Rove had it. Uh, and so these these kind of little things that uh, uh, were going on, you know, you realize somewhere along the way that if we got the nomination, we'd lose all 50 states probably. Um, I mean, I'm just being mm -hmm. honest about mm -hmm. it from like, not from what you guys saw. I mean, none of this stuff actually was ever, I think the, the Newsweek reported some of this after the fact, sort of a post-mortem on the Dean right. campaign. But, um, um so there was a whole bunch of stuff that you knew. If you look at what Rove did with, and these guys did to a guy who won the Mel, you know, won a, a Bronze Star and uh, actually fought in Vietnam. Um, you know what? Um, uh, there was one where we, early on, when he asked, was asked about uh, Wes Clark potentially being his vice president, um, he said that he was at something to the effect that he was. Uh, little light on or didn't understand foreign policy and defense, so it might be a really good idea if he picked somebody like Wes Clark to be his vice president. I mean, you did, there were two or three of those, like, real early on that you, re, that you realized were on tape and that Rove was going to use if we ever... But back then, you were at 0%, and it was kind of like, <laughs> shoot, you know, I'll worry about that, having to face that when we get the nominee and when we get there, because 
you know, frankly, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of hope of us getting there, getting out where we started from. Um, so somewhere around October, you start going like, oh man, we might get there. That's great, except for those things. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so the, I mean, so it was very uh, kind of like, you know, you never, you, there was never a celebration. Or, I mean, we were never like, hey, we're winning this thing kind of thing. It was just like always kind of. I mean, I got to the point where October I was having nightmares about us if we won the nomination. I mean, we, we in the David Bowie song, you know, we'd be heroes just for one day. Because as soon as we got the nomination, they would just uh, uh, take in some of those quotes and annihilated us. And, and I want to say, though, two things. One, Dean is absolutely was the most courageous guy I've ever worked for. You can't have a, a, a guy, I've never worked for somebody, when you could show him that 80% of the American people were for the war, 80% in our own polling, every day for months were for the war because this is right in the run up, right at, you know, as, uh, as the country got caught up in it and supporting Bush. And 80%, he, he went out every day, I'm against it. Um, so I, 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 what I tell people, and I, and I believe it, is that what we had was a, a, a candidate who had more courage than anybody I'd ever worked for, who'd had almost no experience at running in a tough campaign. He'd been lieutenant governor. He became governor when the governor died. Uh, he was one of the great governors in Vermont history. He raised the minimum wage twice, uh, to seven, raised it to $7, lowered the income tax, balanced the budget 12 years in a row. 97% uh, of children in Vermont had health care. 91% of adults were covered with health care. 33% of seniors had prescription drug benefits long before the national government was even talking about the screwed up plan that we have. But he did all that. And that meant that no one, nobody in their right mind on the Republican side would run against him. I mean, they, they'd run Bozo the Clown against him if they could talk Bozo into doing it. So he wins election without having a tough fight. And then he never has a tough fight because he's a great governor. So he never has a race. So he decides that the first contested race of his life will be for president of the United States of America, which means like a lot of politicians who've run, made really stupid rookie mistakes when they ran for state senate or city council for the first time in their first tough race, Howard was making some of those mistakes, you know, prime time. in prime time for president. They just looked bigger than they were because of that. Joe, me, the last campaign I had run, run, I've been involved in a lot of presidential campaigns, but the last campaign I'd actually managed was for city attorney of Los Angeles in 1985. So it just turns out that I'm the only guy stupid enough to get in my car and drive to Burlington, Vermont, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, Carvel, Donna Brazil, although they weren't going up there to work for Mr. Asterisk Man, with 98,000, and the kids that were coming into the campaign to fill the real senior positions, I mean, literally 22-year-old kids running a quarter of the nation, and they're coming in to my office screaming at the top of their lungs, put me in coach. And I'm, and I'm basically, have you ever played shortstop before? <laughs> and the kids going like, no, but I've got a club. And you're going like, that's a, that's a catcher's mitt. <laughs> you know, and so you get the kid the right glove and you tell him to stand between second and third and you say, look, whatever you do, just stop the ball. Keep it in front of you. Just knock it down. Do not throw it anywhere. <laughs> look over at the coach. We'll be pointing to where you should <laughs> throw the ball. And... So, I mean, you know, if you think about it, you got a guy who's running, whose first contested race is, president, is for President of the United States. You got a guy who's running it, who's got different ideas about the internet and things and getting people involved, but he hasn't run a race since 1985, and it was for city attorney of Los Angeles. And you've got a bunch of 22 year old kids who are running a quarter of the country who've never, this is the first campaign they've ever been involved in. In that sense, this is the biggest miracle that's ever happened in presidential politics. 650,000 people join it. It raises more money. We raised more money than President Clinton. 
And we, and, and by the way, we didn't raise more money than President Clinton did. We didn't break his record. He didn't set that record as governor of Arkansas running for president. No, no, no. The record we broke was the record of President Clinton in the White House running for real, the amount he raised running for re-election in 1996. And with all due respect to President Clinton, we didn't have the Lincoln bedroom to sell for $100,000 a night. <laughs> So, I mean, we were doing it with people giving $77 and, and believing in what we were doing. So, um, you know, in the end, I don't make any um, uh, apologies for, uh, and I don't need to for, the, for, for Dean. He, he um, had courage. He, he put his faith in me and a lot of kids, and a lot of Americans put their faith in each other. And, uh, and, we, did, and we did some amazing stuff, and I think there are people out there who will feel the ripples in further congressional uh, elections, I think, uh, I do think in the end the best thing happened. I mean, I, I'm not going to pull any uh, bones about that either. I mean, there's no way in my view um, that we would have sustained um, um, and won um, uh, beat Bush because of, because of what I'm saying, some rookie mistakes, some of my mistakes, um, you know, the staff, et cetera. Uh, we would have lost. We would have been heroes just for the day we won the nomination, and then, uh, and then um, uh, we would have. Uh, uh, I mean, I, the one part that bothers me about saying that is, you know what? I would have much rather have gone down fighting for what we believed in than the way we went down. So, um, so I mean, with the Kerry campaign, and I'm, that's you know just me. So in the end, you know, I don't know. Maybe the right thing didn't happen. Maybe it would have been better for. A, us to have won and lost, but lost fighting for uh, against what we thought was wrong and trying to send a message to the country that we needed to change. But um, I still think in the end, the, probably what was best for the party at the time was for, uh, you know, in, in hindsight, I actually think Gephardt, the, the one thing that, that Gephardt might have been a better general election candidate than, than any of us. Uh, now in total hindsight, when you look at Kerry, I think Gephardt, any Democrat running would have won the states that Kerry ended up winning. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, which of us could have won Ohio or Missouri? And uh, no, but I mean, you know, where are the places? And I think, you know, you know, I think Gephardt feels more like Ohio to me than. Than, I mean the candidacy, so I, I don't know, but that's the only speculation I'll do. I'll I know it wouldn't have been us. Yeah, I don't know if Gephardt would have. You spoke about the courage to go against 80% poll numbers that showed favorability towards the war. Most of the Democrats out there today are cutting some type of tact. Um, you know, there, there was, of course, my guys old saying about I voted for the war before or I voted, voted against, against it. it. Yeah. Um, you've that seen was a rookie mistake. An honest one, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, a, a lot of the potential candidates that you see out now, um, yeah. Senator Clinton, Governor Warner, uh, these are people who, have, who seem to be trying to sail a middle course with a prevailing wind, you know, they're trying to move towards the center. Somebody like Russ Feingold, who's just had what I think is a fair amount of courage to step outside the box and take on the president. What are your thoughts on Feingold? Is this some type of posturing for 08? I, I, whether it is or it isn't, I still give him a great deal of credit oh. for having the courage to do it. And is it in any way, if it is posturing, do you see it as setting him apart from anyone? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't think it's posturing. I mean, Feingold's been out there. I mean, voted the only guy who voted against voted the against Patriot Act. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, he, you know, I don't think he was posturing then. I mean, certainly he was mm -hmm. the only guy. So I think this is what he really thinks. Um, and thank God somebody thinks it. So. That's good. Um, um, I think uh, I think it's really going to be difficult for any, no matter who postures, Mark Warner, whoever. I agree with you. Feingold's done the best job of really staking out, um, you know, turf that I think is important to stake out. I still don't. 
my own view is I still don't see how Hillary, if she decides to go for the nomination, is beatable in the Demo you know, wh how anybody can beat her in the Democratic uh, uh, primaries. And, and um, uh, I think that that has, uh, I mean, I would caution everybody who says never say never and all that kind of stuff that the, the real reason is I don't see how any of the current candidates stop her from getting about 90 to 95 percent of the African American vote in a, in, in, as we roll through. I mean, the, the Clinton, you got sort of two historic names right now in that community, Kennedy and, and Clinton. Um, I mean, both, uh, Clinton is revered in the African American, re, re, absolutely revered. It wasn't, Bill, you know, Howard Dean didn't run around saying if Bill Clinton can be the first black president, I want to be the first gay president. Just out of thin air, it was he was giving homage to uh, the president's uh, strength in the African American community. So, uh, you know, I don't see how, you know, the governor of Iowa, the, go the senator from Indiana, or the governor from you know Mark Warner from Virginia, or Feingold even from Wisconsin, cut into that. That doesn't mean it's not. Po I, I'm just not smart enough to figure that out. But uh, isn't there the potential for the same type of, not that there was a Clinton in the race, but couldn't those same activist roots be mobilized that were mobilized in 03 and 0, well, 03 for Dean that could create an image of a, or not an image, but create a groundswell? Yeah, I think that could be, you know. I mean, I think he plays to that same. No, we're fighting for, you know, there, there's going to be a fight for who's the, who's the, you know, look, there's, I think there's going to be two tracks in the 2008 Democratic side. There's going to be the Hillary track, and then there's going to be right. someone else. And, um, you know, there's a lot of guys fighting for the right of Hillary track. I mean, the Mark Warner, mm -hmm. Evan Bayh, Tom Vilsack think it's going to be Hillary and somebody to her right. I think you're right. It could, I think they may be, or, you know, they could very well be Hillary and Feingold to right. her left, right. and the guys to the right just don't ever get off the ground. Um, but even then, he still has the problem of, okay, so now you're going to Maryland, Georgia, Illinois, Michigan, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, uh, I used to, in, you know, people don't realize in 92 that Clinton was actually winning the nomination. I mean, Bob Carey from Nebraska with his Medal of Honor and Navy SEAL background was rolling into these southern states and beating Bill Clinton 65-35 among white Democrats in places like Georgia. Clinton was beating Kerry 95-5 to among African American Democrats in Georgia. And when you do that all in the wash, Clinton wins by five or six points. Now, no one saw that divide underneath because you have two white candidates that are, you know, fighting it out. Um, you know, it, I think that's the same kind of thing that's gonna that can happen with um, with Hillary and Russ. And ha I mean, how do you? I don't know how he wins that. My own view is that uh, that you. I, I think you're that there's a good chance he's he's right, and it's going to be a you know somebody coming off to her left that that the left gets line. the other track. Yeah, right. gets the the track. But I'm not. I'm not saying she is automatically yet. I'm just saying I have a really uh, tough time trying. I'm, I don't think by any means, by the way, that I'm like one of the smartest people on the planet. But I can't figure out how you get by her. If and, and I'm more than willing to listen to somebody else explain it to me. I really am, but I just can't <laughs> figure it out. So. No, it does seem to be an overwhelming. Yeah, I mean obstacle. President Clinton's a pretty. I mean, pretty unbelievable weapon. Yeah, you no know, question. Not just with that community. I'm using them as an example, but it's you know it'd be really tough to see how somebody gets you know him in Harlem. I don't know, I don't know how somebody's gonna do that. <laughs> Rather than me keep going, is there anybody out there who would like to ask Joe a question? We've got some. Sure. The question is, is can Hillary Clinton win? Um, 
And, and look, here, uh, first of all, the people who say she can't win, I, I don't think, like, you know, it's not just her. The other party's got to nominate somebody, right? I mean, you know, I mean, it's going to. Now, you know, look, if it's Rudy Giuliani, that's going to be tough for her to win, maybe. Uh, I don't think there's a chance of Rudy Giuliani being nominated by the Republican Party. You know, snowballs in hell have a better chance than, than that happened. I really do. I don't care what the polls say. Uh, uh, so they're going to nominate somebody on the other side. And my own view is that um, that movement conservatives, I'm not talking about the Republic. I'm talking about movement conservatives, um, have been so empowered by the Bush, by the way Bush ran the campaigns, so that it's going to be very tough for anybody but a movement conservative to be nominated. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, Sam Brown back, Newt Gingrich, uh, uh, Frist, George Allen, somebody of that flavor is going to get the nomination. Um, so let's like, you know, so I mean, to get you to understand what I'm talking about, Newt Gingrich versus Hillary Clinton. Now does she have a chance? Does Newt have a chance? Does the entire country go, oh my God? I don't know, but you, you know, but you, you know, but I'm just, but I'm saying, so you, you know, that's what I think is going to happen here. I don't think this is going to be, um, you know, I, personally, I don't think John McCain is. He's not a movement. He's not trusted enough, I don't think, by the movement conservatives. He's trying to move over to get their support, and, and he may be able to. But that's what it's going to take, and, and the movement conservatives are not going to, having just got Alito, I mean, they just got the Supreme Court finally, they finally have the House and the Senate, which is going to be on the brink of going in 2006 because of how messed up uh, things are, and, and um, they're not going to risk coming from all this way, and, and in their fight in 2008, to not nominate somebody who's going to finish the revolution. You know, Newt started it in 94, and damn it, we're going to finish it. And that's where I think they're, the Republican Party, like it or not, I'm not talking about, this isn't like some plan Rove has. There's certain times in history where all the best planners and strategists on the planet cannot stop a movement from rising up and taking control of a party. And I think that's one of the things that threatens the Republican Party right now. And so you can get, and, and so, you know, you can get uh, that kind of movement conservative versus Hillary. Both sides will absolutely believe the other one is the devil. I mean, it will be the most polarizing, it will be make the last two campaigns that we think are polarizing be like patty cake. And um, and it could be one of the largest turnouts and sort of biggest, you know, most involved elections out there. I also think that that potentially leaves a huge opening for an independent candidacy. I mean, if 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 the conser if the Republicans move to a, a um, cons movement conservative, we nominate Hillary. The entire country's sitting there going like doing the oh my god thing, and a and, and somebody. Some senator, or some governor, um, says, "You know, I'm running as an independent because both these parties have gone mad, and they, you know, it, it, and it's a mess, and no one's fixing anything, and they're bickering with each other instead of solving our problems. And let's, you know, join with me and let's change this mess. You know, that could happen too. So I think eight, I think 2008 is going to be one of the most disruptive, poll, you know, just very." Like roller coaster, energized, polarized, shocking elections we've had in a long, long time. Uh, I mean, I really do. So it's encouraging. I see. No, I, but I think it may be good for the country. Okay, we have a question over here. Uh, and this is strictly as a shrewd Democratic political strategist, but say this. Um, South Dakota abortion ban that was just signed into law eventually is appealed to the Supreme Court and they find out that they have five votes and Roe versus Wade is overturned, would that ultimately be a good thing for the Democratic Party? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think that's that's clearly the problem. I think that the 
the administration's been, the current administration's been trying to avoid. I don't think they want, I mean, you have to ask yourself if there's, if they have the court, if they have the House and the Senate, and they have the presidency, you know, let, I, I'll flip this around. If we had lived in the next last 50 years in a pro-life country in which abortion was murder, and, and on the books that way, and the Democrats had finally, after 50 years, gotten the Supreme Court, had Bill Clinton in the presidency, had the Senate and the House for the first time in 50 years, and Nancy Pelosi had not introduced a bill to make abortion legal, the movement left would be apoplectic and in 2008 would be screaming to nominate, couldn't believe that after doing all that we didn't get some, we, we got to do something. That's where they're at. I mean, you have to understand that that's where, and so that's why the South, in other words, the frustration that no one in Washington to this day has put the bill in the hopper to, to make it legal and go up the, or, or make a, uh, it murder and go up the, I mean, I'm, I'm using very crass political terms here because I'm trying to make sure everybody gets what I'm saying. That that, the fact that that never has not happened is now starting to percolate out in the, if you're not going to do it, We'll do it here in South Dakota, and we'll do it that way. That's the frustration that's starting to happen among movement conservatives that I think is a real threat to the fabric of the Republican, the Republican majority. The I mean, that, that, that carries them to, to victory at the national level um, is 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 that's the schism that's happening. And on the left, we're doing. I mean, you know, on the Democratic side, we're looking at Hillary, and yeah. So if it happens that way. I think in the end it'll benefit the the Democrats, but you know we'll see. This is a gentleman right here. That well, what impact do you think the current oh, what impact do you think the current uh, war in Iraq is going to have on the old six uh, elections, especially in the House? Is, uh, well, I mean the the, the 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 look. There's no doubt. That, I mean, there's two things going on. First of all, I would caution everybody that the I think 2006 is going to be more anti-incumbent than it is anti-Republican. I think it's going to be anti-Republican, but it's really people are, I think, sick of all of them. Okay, I mean, it, you know, it's they're they're sick of the Repu things are bad, and they don't really think the Democrats are standing up or 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 they're just going along or whatever. So I think you're going to see some Democrats go out, incumbents go out the window, as, as well as see Republicans. In the end, though. I think you know it's going to be a lot more Republicans than Democrats, partly because there's more of them. And I think you know there's there's a good chance we'll take the Senate, decent chance that the Senate will come back to Democratic hands. And except for the problem of redistricting, you know the problem is look you can't redraw Pennsylvania's lines. It's a state. Santorum's got to live. And Bob Casey got to live within that thing. There's no way to draw a few more Republicans in to make sure Santorum's going to win. So I think you know you, that's why you're going to see more change in the Senate and the House because most of these House districts, you know, have been written to 90, you know, to ensure that 98% of members, regardless of party, are safe. So even though there may be this big desire to throw them out, you know, in a district where Republicans normally going to get 65% of the vote, he's going to get 53, but he's still going to survive it. So I think you're going to see gains in the House, maybe big gains, but the reason they're going to be muted is because of redistricting. And I don't, I don't, I think that might stop the Democrats from getting the House back. Uh, but it could be so big a tsunami that, you know, we'll see.